Our guests of honor, the Honorable Minister of Environment and the Ambassador of the Federal Republic of Germany to Rwanda, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, all protocols observed. Good morning and welcome to the inaugural Kigali Climate Talks. Uh, today marks a significant milestone as we launch this pivotal series, a joint initiative of the German Embassy in Kigali and the government of Rwanda, uh, long-standing allies in climate and environmental initiatives, um, elevating, uh, taking place at the time when the German Embassy has been elevated to a climate-focused embassy, so quite opportune uh, time to have these talks uh, setting off. Our aim is clear today. Uh, we're here to catalyze dialogue and action on crucial international climate discussions, uh, agreements and obligations, and how to take these forward in the Rwandan context. My name is Lilian Wanzigamupende, and I'm the Adaptation and Green Cities Lead uh, for the Rwanda Country Program, Global Green Growth Institute. And it's a privilege and an honor to be able to uh, moderate today's session. Um, Moving forward, we are here to um, have, as I said, an active discussion um, promoting the implementation of global climate agenda, agenda here in Rwanda. Our focus is on Rwanda's climate action plan. We'll be highlighting our nation's progress, ambitions, and the urgent need for global support and investment to achieve our NDC goals. We are gathered here, as I started, as uh, government representatives, development partners, civil society members, academia, industry leaders, and youth. Uh, we will start our event with welcome remarks from both uh, the Honorable Minister and the Ambassador. We will then follow this with a short video and a moderated discussion followed by a Q&A. I would especially like to recognize uh, the students from the University of Rwanda School of Architecture and built environment, specifically because they are hosting us and joining us in today's event, and also because we are aware that the youth are tomorrow's future, and therefore it is very critical to have them actively engaged in these discussions. Together, we will explore the challenges and opportunities in climate medication and adaptation, policy development, and how we can all be more innovative as we develop the next generation of Rwanda's climate action plan, our NDCs 3.0. Let's engage and inspire each other. Let's have this as an interactive discussion, a discussion that aims to scale and introduce sustainable solutions for our shared future. And I thank you all for being here to support and contribute to this crucial dialogue. Um, let's make this first session of the Kigali Climate Talks a resounding success. Uh, a few housekeeping matters before we start off. Um, the toilets are located across the quad, right uh, to the extreme right of this uh, building. Uh, when you exit, uh, there'll be ushers who can direct you should you need to use the bathroom. Um, the water is available at the back of the auditorium, but also at the front of the auditorium. You are all fully aware we're zero plastic, so please feel free to pick a glass, get some water, and settle down. At the end of the event, we will have a chance to network over light snacks at the back of the auditorium. As I always encourage people, look for three people you don't know that you're meeting for the first time. Introduce yourself and get to know somebody uh, who's in this space, but that you haven't had a chance to meet before. If you're tweeting about today's event, uh, kindly use the hashtags, hashtag Kigali Climate Talks and hashtag Green Rwanda. Thank you very much, and once again, uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be your MC and moderator this morning, and it is now my pleasure to welcome our guest of honor uh, to deliver their remarks. We will first hear from our very own champion of the environment. I always like to add young at heart and young in action, uh, our Minister of Environment, uh, Dr. Jean d'Arc Mujawa Maria. Please welcome. Thank you very much, Lillian. 
Your Excellency, the Ambassador of Germany to Rwanda and your delegation from the Embassy, Global Director of the NDC Partnership Support Unit, Pablo, and the delegation of the Steering Committee of NDCP, distinguished guests, dear students, dear academic staff, Ladies and gentlemen, friend of our environment and climate, good morning, Ngaram Tseneza. On behalf of the government of Rwanda, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this inaugural Kigali Climate Talks event. And we, th we thank this School of Architecture to have welcomed us to their beautiful uh, compound. Addressing climate change requires collaboration between all nations and organizations. Inclusive, robust, and open dialogue is an important ingredient in our shared effort to mitigate and adapt to climate change. We are holding today's climate dialogue to foster discussion and action on international climate agreements and obligations. And importantly, how they relate to Rwanda and our varied partners. I would like to take this opportunity, Your Excellency, and take a moment to thank the federal government of Germany for partnering with Rwanda to implement our ambitious climate action plan. We thank you. The Kigali Climate Talks is just one initiative among many others in our wide-ranging and productive climate and development partnership. Thank you for being a reliable climate ally Rwanda. As we discuss Rwanda's climate action plan, our NDCs, and how we can foster implementation and ambition, I want to reiterate that Rwanda's commitment to the global climate goals embedded in the Paris Agreement is rock solid. It is an, a commitment that is aligned with the country's long-term goal to be a developed carbon neutral and climate resilient economy by 2050. Ladies and gentlemen, climate change is affecting all of us. If we are to safeguard the well-being of citizens and our economies, we need to address the impact of climate change through our development programs. This is why the government of Rwanda has chosen to pursue a green growth approach to sustainable development. Climate considerations have been mainstreamed into sectoral policies, strategies, and plans it is a whole of government and a whole of society approach. Rwanda's NDC includes our commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 38% by 2030 compared to business as usual. We are also strengthening the country's resilience to climate change through a range of adaptation measures with a focus on nature-based solutions. Implementing our NDC requires considerable financial resources, but also capacity and technological requirements, including research and development that support evidence-based decisions. The Kigali Climate Talks are a great platform 
to enhance good practices, analyze challenges, and identify solutions to make climate action more effective. I urge everyone to engage in an open, frank, and objective discussion to make these talks productive and memorable. I believe that with everyone's participation, decision makers, private sector, civil society organization, and the young people who are the future of this country, we can make real change as we embark with innovative solutions towards decarbonization and climate resilience. What awaits us in a brighter and a healthier future for all? Dear partners and friends of Rwanda, as co-chair of the NDC partnership alongside Denmark, Rwanda this week hosted the Partnership Spring Steering Committee meeting. And I'm sure it was successful. And I request don't go away. Take days to visit Rwanda. I was happy to hear that a shared understanding exists that we need to do more at speed and scale to limit global heating to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Thank you, Pablo, the global director of the NDC Partnership Support Unit, and your team for being with us for choosing Rwanda. Today's climate, Kigali Climate Talks will be the first of many, and I hope we use this platform to reflect on what has worked and the what has not worked and strive to act together to address climate change and to be the changes we want to see. We have a once in a lifetime opportunity to raise our ambition and meet the climate change head on. It's, it's now time to raise our ambitions, not the sea level. I'm confident that Rwanda, with support from our partners, including the federal government of Germany, is well placed to meet that call. I wish you all a very successful event and you look forward to insightful discussions. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Minister, for those very inspiring words. Uh, Rwanda's NDCs indeed must not simply be on page. We acknowledge that uh, climate action has been mainstreamed across all the sectors. It's now a whole of government and whole of society, as you've indicated, but we must see how we bring to life our actual ambitions in our everyday actions. We are working for a brighter and healthier future for all, and Kigali Climate Talks is a chance for us to reflect on what has succeeded, what has failed, and use these as frank talks to erase our ambitions and our actions and our commitments. We are now very pleased uh, to welcome uh, Her Excellency Haik Uta Detman. I hope I pronounced that right. I will add a Kenyarwanda name at the end so that uh, next time I don't get it right, I can do that. Ambassador of the Federal Republic of uh, Germany to Rwanda. Germany has been a steadfast partner of Rwanda, especially in the field of climate action, more so now that the German embassy has been designated as a climate um, embassy. And it's a great opportunity for us to hear from uh, Her Excellency and uh, have her share her remarks today. Please welcome her. Thank you.
Thank you, Lilian. Murao. Guten Morgen, good morning. Honorable uh, Minister of the Environment, uh, dear Jeanne, if I may. Dear Global Director of NDC Partnership Support Unit, dear representatives of the government uh, of Rwanda, dear representatives of civil society, of again academia, the private sector, especially dear students, thank you also for hosting us in this really spectacular and wonderful building. I mean, it's, it's really a great setup. Dear members of the diplomatic corps, uh, dear fellow development partners, dear all, I hope I didn't uh, forget anybody. Um, it is really not only um, um, everyday event uh, that's here. It's a very special day. It's a very um, particular uh, event to have here the first uh, climate talks um, organized by the government of Rwanda um, and the um, uh, Embassy of the Federal Republic of Germany here um, in uh, Kigali. It's a completely new format and I'm very grateful to each and everyone who has made this possible, especially of course my wonderful team in the embassy and all those who've worked, uh, I think, day and night, if I understand correctly, to, to make all this uh, uh, happen. Um, as you have been kind enough uh, to, to mention it, uh, Lilian, um, the, um, embassy, the German embassy in Kigali has been officially named um, an, a climate um, um, a part, uh, a climate uh, embassy, and for us it's uh, a lot of new work, of course, but it's also a badge of honor. And it's just a result of the wonderful cooperation that's uh, going on, and I think I have to uh, um, thank you, uh, Honorable Minister, personally also for all the dedicated work, and um, yeah, your kind words uh, showed the appreciation, and I can just tell you this goes uh, in both ways. We extremely appreciate the cooperation uh, with Rwanda. Um, part of our climate partnership um, um, is the financing for climate-focused youth projects and their participation in international climate processes, but also a new structured and regular format to foster in-country dialogue and action on the international climate discussions agreement and obligations, the Kigali Climate Talks. This is why we are here today. So I'm really excited to be here to open uh, this new chapter of bilateral cooperation with you, Honorable Minister. And it's, an, it's meant to be an integral part uh, of our strong uh, existing partnership. And if I just uh, may add, this partnership will have its second birthday this year. Um, the Kigali Climate Talks will facilitate how topics on the agenda of international climate negotiations reverberate in the Rwandan context. And we agreed, dear Minister, to put a strong focus on implementation because this is what really counts in the end. Not to talk, but to implement, to do something. And this is what is so, yeah, so inspiring in Rwanda that you are so dedicated to really doing things. Uh, action is timely. Um, it's not only uh, last May that Rwanda had to mourn uh, victims of uh, climate change, coast floods and landslides this year. Unfortunately, yet again, Rwanda has been heavily hit, as have been the neighboring countries, which I just mentioned what's going on in Kenya, Tanzania, Burundi. So all this uh, is, is happening. I mean, re really, and I'm of, of an older generation, but unfortunately, it's really now you see it each and every year that climate change has dramatic effects on each and every one. But the good thing, good news, is that a lot is happening uh, in Rwanda regarding climate action. Last, uh, last year, the uh, revised Green Growth and Climate Resilience Strategy was launch, launched, and just as we speak, Rwanda is in an encompassing national climate and nature finance strategy. And finance, I mean, in the end you mentioned it, dear Minister, finance is crucial. So, the focus of today's inaugural event of the Kigali Climate Talks is the implementation and update of Rwanda's climate action plan under the Paris Agreement, the nationally determined contribution NDP. 
see. The level of ambition for the next NDCs will decide on whether limiting global warming to 1.5 uh, degrees centigrade remains in reach or not. And if not, we all know what the consequences will be. Not maybe for, for me, but for the next generation. Um, Rwanda was the first um, LDC to submit revised NDCs back in uh, 2020 already. And of 2021, launched the NDC implementation framework. So one of the uh, questions today will be, what has been achieved and where are more effects needed? Other questions. What does Rwanda want to prioritize for its next NDC? How can we ensure appropriate and novel financing mechanisms to warrant the implementation? So I think these are our questions, very pertinent questions that will come up today. And I'm uh, really delighted that today's uh, event comes back to back with the steering committee meeting of the NDC partnership which was uh, co-shared by Rwanda and Denmark. So hello to my Danish colleagues here. And I mean, this also proves that Germany, like Denmark, we are all part of Team Europe here. And we are all well, working together with Rwanda for the same uh, uh, aims. Uh, so the partnership uh, meeting that, took, uh, uh, that ended yesterday only. I'm very pleased to welcome uh, the, those who uh, decided to stay behind uh, in Kigali for tonight's, uh, for today's event. And uh, my particular thanks go to Pablo Vieira, uh, the president of NDC Partnership. Muchas gracias. For accepting an active role today, a song, uh, alongside with all the other uh, eminent uh, uh, panelists. So uh, I think everyone is eager not to hear me talk, but to dive into the exchange. I wish uh, all of you fruitful discussions and I thank you very much for being here and being part of Kigali Climate Talks. Thank you so much. Sorry for that. Thank you very much for your kind remarks, uh, Your Excellency, and for Germany's, con Germany's continued uh, commitment to Rwanda's climate resilience and for the initiative of the German Embassy to create the Kigali Climate Talks. Um, once again, I emphasize quite an opportune time as uh, the embassy has now been designated as a climate-focused embassy, and this elevates the importance of the joint commitment to climate resilience. And most importantly, these talks, uh, as you have highlighted, are a chance for us to foster internal dialogues on climate, dialo uh, climate action um, emphasis, like you've mentioned, is on timely implementation, not just implementation, but timely implementation amid climate impacts like flooding, which result in dramatic effects such as loss of life and property. Thank you very much for those remarks. Moving on, we will have uh, an opportunity to follow an introduction video that explains Rwanda's NDC. Uh, if the team can set this up. Um, we have the opportunity to learn about Rwanda's ambitious plan to be climate resilient, reduce emissions, and promote green growth. In this video, a young Rwandan student, Chiara, shares her vision for a green Rwanda. I hope you enjoy this. I'd like to tell you about a dream I have for my country. My name is Kiara and I'm 12 years old. In my dream, Rwanda is covered with lush green forests and powered by renewable energy. The air is clean and the rivers and lakes are clear. In my dream, people and nature live together as one and all plants and animals are thriving. To make this possible, we'll build cities that are sustainable. We will restore ecosystems and protect Mother Nature. We will modernize farming to be more efficient and resilient and build transport systems powered by electricity. But we are going to need everyone's support. To be 
build a bright future for the next generation, Rwanda is putting the environment at the heart of everything we do. We have an ambitious plan to reduce the emissions by 38% by the end of this decade and a bold vision to be climate resilient and carbon neutral by 2050. But we can't do it alone. That's why we created Rwanda Green Fund as a world-class investment facility that works with partners around the world to finance our goals. The Rwanda Green Fund aims to be the engine for green growth in Rwanda. We invest in projects that bring about transformative change. We have mobilized over $200 million for climate action and invested in 44 projects across the country. With these investments, we are improving lives, creating green jobs, generating clean energy, and protecting our environment. Not long ago, this wetland was degraded, and this resulted in many birds and wildlife disappearing. But today, Nyandungu Urban Wetland has been restored, and it's the first urban ecotourism park of its kind in Rwanda. Young people can come here and explore a lush green wetland and hear bird song in the heart of Kigali. I'm proud that my country values nature. It gives me hope for the future. I can't wait to restore other wetlands and help my city be more resilient to climate change. The chai chatu, chaja kachire njerguwa no muzure, utewe ni mfura nyenshi. Kuburiji mfura ya guaga, chai chao se chikare njerguwa chigatawamu. Oyumonsi, turigu hangana ni mihenda gulichire hivi. Turigu teri chai chatu kumusozi, ahatazo njera kui wasirguwa ni viza, kuize kumusaruruzi yonjera, kandi miwele hoya chikawa mnyeza kurushawu. Because the Rwanda Green Fund invested in this e-waste recycling plant, I can use my technical skills to protect the environment. I'm proud to help make the dreams of young Rwandans a reality by turning waste into wealth. I never imagined that I would ride an electric motorbike, but I love it. My daily income has increased by 50% because it's cheaper to run and maintain an electric motorbike. I'm proud to be doing what I can to fight against air pollution and protect our environment for my own children. The investments we've made with the support of our partners are helping us to make young people's dreams a reality. But there is more exciting work to be done. We want to raise $11 billion by the year 2030 to fund our NDC Climate Action Plan. This will require both attracting grant funding and tapping into private investments. By working with partners here in Rwanda and around the world, we believe we can achieve this goal. I invite you to join us and support the work of the Rwanda Green Fund. I truly believe that Rwanda is one of the world's best destinations for green investment. Close your eyes. Imagine it's 2050. Close your eyes. Because of your investments, and actually Rwandans are employed in well-paying green jobs. Floods and landslides don't happen anymore because we planted trees and restored our forests and wetlands. My own children catch an electric cable car to school every day. The air is clean, the sky is blue. Rwanda is carbon neutral. This is the future I dream of, and I know it's possible. Will you dare to dream with me? She paints a very beautiful future for Rwanda's citizens and residents. And uh, I hope we can all be inspired by Chera's dream and uh, that it also inspires the next segment of our program, a panel discussion on Rwanda's Climate Action Plan, NDC, Implementation and Ambition. I get goose pimples whenever I see that video and uh, then I want to live longer and longer. So I'm, I'm assuming it's probably the same for most of you here as well. 
So I'd like to now uh, introduce our next session. Uh, as I indicated earlier on, this is a panel discussion, and we are privileged to have four distinguished speakers who will delve into Rwanda's ongoing efforts and future plans regarding its nationally determined contributions. Each speaker brings a wealth of knowledge and experience that promises to enrich our understanding of Rwanda's progress and the ambitious targets set in response to the global stock take. We look forward to a lively and insightful exchange of ideas uh, as we explore the steps Rwanda is taking to address climate change, enhance sustainability, and fulfill its international commitments. Uh, as both the Honorable Minister and uh, Her Excellency the Ambassador highlighted, this is an opportunity for frank talks. So when we do get to the Q&A session, please feel free to openly share your insights, uh, question some of what we are doing as Rwanda, and share uh, great ideas on how we can be able to achieve uh, this ambition. I will start with uh, the Deputy Director General of Rwanda Environment Management Authority, uh, Mr. Foste Munyazikwiye. He is the Deputy Director General of Rwanda Environment Management um, and has over 13 years of technical and management uh, experience in the field of environment and climate change. He is also the UNFCCC National Focal Point for Rwanda and lead negotiator since 2012. He coordinates activities of Green Climate Fund, uh, National Designated Authority Secretariat. He's the Global Environment Facility Operation FP Office, Clean Development Mechanism on Carbon Market DNA Office, as well as the Climate Technology Center and Network for the NDE of Rwanda. Uh, quite a portfolio. Uh, this will be an opportunity for us to uh, inquire on so many uh, vast um, uh, areas. I will then welcome our next uh, panelist, uh, Ms. Eva Peace Mukairanga, the Chief Finance Officer for the Green Protector. Eve Peace is an environmentalist and co-founder of the Loss and Damage Youth Coalition, where she serves as the coordinator of the training working group. Eva is also the co-coordinator of the LNDC's finance working group and the chief finance officer of the Green Protector. For those of you who know the Green Protector, it's a Friends of the Environment uh, organization contributing to Rwanda's sustainable development by inspiring young generations to protect the environment. Welcome, Eve. I will invite our next panelist, uh, Pablo Vieira, uh, Global Director, NDC Partnership Support Unit. Thank you once again for staying on to be a part of this uh, session. Pablo is a leading figure in the environment, green growth, and sustainable rural development uh, sectors. Um, in the past, he uh, was a, an advisor to the President of the Republic of Colombia. He was also serving as the Deputy Minister of Environment and Sustainable Development having previously worked in the private sector. He is currently, as I mentioned, the Global Director for the NDC Partnership Support Unit. Welcome. <laughs> Last but not least, I will welcome uh, Donald Kabanda, Executive Chairman of Prev Rwanda Limited. Donald has cross-cutting experience from government to the private sector industry, as well as international organizations since 2003. Among the pioneers of green transport in Rwanda, I know most of you know him. Um, he is the founding member of the CEO, uh, he's the founding member and CEO of Rwanda Electric Motors, REM, the executive chairman of Prev Rwanda, an electric vehicles company, and he also serves as the chairman of the e-mobility sector in Rwanda and chairman of board of directors of Jali Transport Limited, Rwanda's largest city public transport company. Uh, a hand of applause as we welcome our panelists. We've just heard from Chiara about her dream for a green Rwanda. As I said, I get goose pimples every time I listen to her um, and all the different uh, players in this uh, video sharing the potential goals that we have uh, and potential future that we have. Um, the goals of the country's NDC's Climate Action Plan. 
Rema is in charge of monitoring and reporting of the NDC. How is Rwanda doing in the implementation of the current NDC? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, moderator. Uh, this is really a good question after an inspiring dream of Chela. Uh, we need to work uh, the pace uh, to respond to the expectation of various uh, next generation like Chela. Uh, as far as uh, the NDC is concerned, as you all know, Rwanda's NDC was uh, updated in 2020 with the horizon of 2030 uh, with ambitious uh, target of reducing 38% of our emission uh, by 2030. Uh, but that uh, NDC, of course, has uh, unconditional uh, contributions and conditional contributions. For those who are not familiar with those terms, and conditional contributions, those are uh, the uh, key activities where the government of Rwanda uh, will be able to invest in, and then conditional are uh, those which uh, will necessarily require the uh, external funding. Uh, so, uh, looking at the at where we are uh, after three years and a half, almost four years. Uh, we can say that uh, the trend is positive. Uh, REMA, as a government agency in charge of monitoring uh, the implementation of NDC, uh, the first uh, thing we need to look at is the enabling pillars as the backbone of implementation and monitoring. So those enabling pillars uh, uh, includes uh, conducive institutional setup. I can testify that uh, Rwanda uh, has uh, established a conducive institutional setup where the Ministry of Environment is uh, reading uh, in terms of environment and climate change. And uh, we have established a monitoring uh, verification, uh, reporting and verification in MRV system, which will help us to track uh, the changes uh, uh, we are making in terms of implementing our NDC. We have established uh, a cross-sectoral uh, committee, uh, MRV committee, where all the sectors contributing to uh, our NDC are uh, having uh, uh, focal points. Uh, those uh, sectors include agriculture, energy industry, and others. Uh, but setting up conducive uh, institutional setup is not uh, enough uh, alone. Uh, we also uh, look at the climate finance as another uh, uh, enabling pillar. You can't implement, you can't reduce the vulnerability of our people, you can't reduce emissions we have. We can't change the business as usual if we don't have uh, the financial resources. So the establishment of uh, Rwanda Green Fund was one of the testimony uh, where Rwanda is uh, very keen uh, to create a neighboring environment to implement the NDC. As you saw uh, on the video, the CEO uh, said that so far they have mobilized uh, in, uh, around 200 uh, million US dollars, but that's in general. But we need uh, really, when it comes for conditional uh, contribution, we need to track uh, clearly uh, how many, uh, uh, how much uh, money we have mobilized in terms of implementing the NDC. Uh, so REMA, as the uh, institution in charge of monitoring, uh, it's unfortunate that we are in the middle of uh, quantitative assessment. Uh, uh, at this point in time, I can't tell, uh, I can't give you quantitative figures that we are here against the emissions we pledged. But uh, as you all know, 
we are preparing the biennial transparency report, uh, uh, which will, which have a big part of tracking the emissions we reduced uh, during the implementation of NDC, and we are uh, concluding the report by this October. Uh, therefore, uh, as of now, I can only comment uh, on the qualitative assessments we made, uh, but not, unfortunately, on quantitative uh, 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 figures we have in terms of reducing emissions. So on qualitative, as you saw in different sectors uh, uh, of our economy, we have tried our best comparing to what we included in our NDC. Uh, we have uh, established uh, the NDC implementation uh, framework, which, which uh, elaborated more on various projects in different sectors, which will contribute and which are aligned with various contribution mentioned or in, uh, included in our NDC. And most of the uh, projects have been started. And uh, uh, indeed, as Minister said, for unconditional measures, uh, since Rwanda took a decision of putting uh, climate change at the center of the uh, development, uh, uh, economic development uh, uh, of our country, we successfully mainstream the climate change in different sectors and de facto uh, various sectors uh, have uh, uh, implemented and reported back uh, through the Ministry of Economic Planning and Finance all the activities planned for NST1, which is uh, being concluded this year. So we are very uh, happy and we are very optimistic uh, on the uh, job so far done uh, in terms of uh, uh, implementing, but that's the qualitative assessment, as I said, which will be verified and proven by quantitative assessment, which will be availed uh, by this October. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, DDG. We're definitely looking forward to uh, the quantitative uh, reporting. However, as you've said, the enabling environment has been established, which has definitely uh, been able to push um, the mainstreaming of climate uh, across all the diff climate action, across all the different uh, relevant sectors. Um, I'll come to you, uh, Pablo. Uh, the NDC partnership has been a long-standing partner of Rwanda in supporting the development of the NDC and the NDC implementation uh, framework. From a global perspective, what is your view on the next generation of NDC compared to what we are uh, implementing currently? Um, and do the ambition levels need to be increased or are we still in the right uh, trajectory? First of all, thank you for inviting us. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here um, in this beautiful building and uh, with great partners. Um, to your question, the short answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, ambition needs to be increased. It needs to be increased considerably by all uh, countries. Uh, the First global stock take, which was an exercise that was finalized uh, at COP28 in Dubai at the end of last year, I took uh, stock of the progress in implementation and ambition of the NDCs around the world. And it was very, very clear that even though we have seen a lot of progress um, and climate has become front and center uh, uh, around the world, the reality is that we are off track gravely in terms of uh, the level of ambition of, of the different NDCs in terms of the uh, ineffective mobilization of finance for effective implementation and, of course, limited implementation around the, the world in terms of their current commitments. So as we approach 2025, which is the next time countries have to turn in commitments, the new NDCs, uh, at the end of next year, uh, we have a unique opportunity to correct the course of travel. And this should respond directly to those elements included in the global stock tick. So next round of NDCs need to be fully aligned with Paris. So that's the 1.5 degree temperature goal, but also with regards to the global goals and adaptation. So making sure that countries have the elements that will allow them also to respond to the already seen impacts of climate change. Also, 
They should include all sectors of the economy and all greenhouse gases. They should deliver a just and equitable transition. There's a lot of attention that is being paid to how to transform the economies and the societies in a way that is just. They should be informed by the latest science and they should uh, consider the national circumstances. These are still NDCs, nationally determined, so that's very important. But collectively, we need to reach that, those goals of the Paris Agreement and the outcomes of the global stock take. But I think that more than the actual ambition, what's most important is that these NDCs need to be implementable and they need to be investable, financiable. Because just having a goal does very little if we're not implementing them effectively as we've heard today. So there's a few elements that are critical for, for, for the NDCs to be implementable. No? The targets need to be translated into clear actions, priorities with regards to those actions with a timeline for implementation in terms of clear policies, programs across all sectors. They need to identify the needs and the finance, and they need to be prioritized so that finance and support is mobilized effectively. They need to be backed by technically sound and transparent documents. They need to involve all of government and a whole of society, because at the end of the day, the implementation is done by stakeholders on the ground and by the different sectors and ministries. That will allow NDCs to be implementable and to be um, investable. The NDC partnership, uh, which is a country-driven coalition that brings together over 220 members, including developed countries, developing countries, um, and institutions from around the world, uh, is uh, set up to support developing countries to advance the implementation of their NDCs and to support the development of new NDCs with higher ambition. So our efforts are focusing on uh, both uh, supporting countries as they implement their NDCs, but in particular, at this point, we're looking at ways to support countries as they uh, develop their new NDCs. And there's two key efforts that we're taking at this point. The first one is that together with the UNFCCC and with input from over 40 partners, we are developing a dynamic online tool that is called the NDC 3.0 Navigator that will help countries understand how they can raise ambition in a way that uh, provides the highest possible ambition for the country, but with most relevant actions. No, we, all countries don't need to take the same approach to raising ambition. The national circumstances, which sectors are the, bigger, the ones that emit the most, uh, which uh, parts of the country are the most vulnerable, are the, the critical elements to, to raising ambition. So these navigators allow countries to understand what they have today, what is missing, and how to find new ways to increase ambition in terms of mitigation, and adaptation, but always in the framing of implementable and investable NDCs. We are launching this navigator late this spring, um, and we hope that uh, all countries use it in an effective way. The second element is we have a specific initiative to support countries through technical assistance in develop their new NDCs, also develop or update their long-term strategies and link the two, because it's very important to look at the long-term vision of the countries uh, like Rwanda has, and then use that as an element to identify those ambition elements for the next round that will cover uh, up to 2035. 53 countries are already receiving support and 12 more in the pipeline, but we're seeing every day more and more interest in, in this level of support. And of course, we have our members to thank because they are the ones delivering the support on the ground. So I want to take this opportunity. In terms of Rwanda, of course, as, as it was said, uh, with support from Germany, through GIZ and others, is taking stock of where, where you are. And that's a critical element to start the process of developing your new NDC. You need to know where you are, what you have achieved, what are the challenges to feed into the next round of NDCs. So congratulations on that and connecting it to the BTR is, is fundamental. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that insight, uh, Pablo. I, I like the way you coined it. They must be uh, both implementable and investable. I think that's always at the core of uh, all the initiatives. If it's not implementable, if it's not uh, investable, then you definitely will not uh, achieve it. Uh, I come to you, Eva Peace. Um, you have been conducting awareness uh, raising with young Rwandans. Uh, and also have had a chance to participate in international climate negotiations. How do you see the role of youth organizations such as the Green Protector 
in supporting NDC implementation. Uh, thank you so much, Lilian, uh, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, as I mentioned, in to the participation in the negotiation, I would say, uh, as mentioned, there is the global goal. There's different countries. There is all all countries have like a unique global goal, but in order to reach like the Paris Agreement, it must come on the national level, and I think the NDC is a way to achieve that. And making sure that youth organizations such as the Green Protector are part of in, uh, in the implementation of the NDC, it's vital and it's crucial. Uh, and for example, say like uh, it's important in making, they can contribute in many ways, in different ways. Uh, some are part of uh, the private sectors, also part of the civil societies. And through our action, we, through the participation and understanding of the NDC, we are able to make sure that our activities, what we are planning for, it's aligned with the country's vision, with the NDC, and then making sure that the community voices, youth concerns, it's, uh, it's brought on the decision-making table, it's brought, it's, uh, it's being part of the country's uh, plan. So that's a way, that's a way we see it by being part of the NDC implementation or being in the community together, youth organization are also bring the voices and also the helping the countries to implement the visions. And I would say as a, um, an example, I would say through our participation in climate negotiation and support from the government and making sure that our engagement is meaningful, it has it to have been a success story to have like champions like loss and damage champions and now we have been able to have like uh, a policy we've been advocating for being uh, adopted uh, at COP28 and now having a loss and damage fund and so that's a way we are contributing to the NDC through our advocacy, through our work in climate education, making sure that uh, children, youth have an understanding of what's going, what's happening and how they can contribute. Um, You'll, yes, that's how I see it. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Eva Peace. Uh, indeed, your meaningful engagement uh, uh, and advocacy has resulted in uh, you know, uh, strategic um, uh, commitments or interventions such as the establishment of the Loss and Damage Fund. And um, as you said, uh, the youth plays a critical role in the private sector, in the civil society. Uh, and you do uh, represent uh, the community's voices in many times, and therefore um, your engagement uh, is critical to ensuring that you can align uh, and feed into uh, the global ambitions as well. So thank you very much for those uh, interventions. Um, over to you, Donald. Um, first of all, I want an EV. Uh, special rate, maybe I can negotiate while I'm still on the panel. <laughs> But um, those of you who um, have been following the e-mobility conversation, you've seen quite a bit of the work that's being done by REM and uh, PREV Rwanda. Um, so investing in climate-friendly technologies and systems uh, can be costly and uh, has led to calls for greater incentives to support the private sector to go green. Uh, as an e-mobility company, how do you see this challenge? Uh, how can the role of the private sector be enhanced with regard to green growth and climate change mitigation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ria. Uh, first of all, the vehicle is in stock, so you are able to pick one. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, first of all, uh, thank you for involving private sector uh, into this uh, great initiative for climate change. and. Uh, involving private sector, of course, with the initiatives that are not investable. Uh, sometimes it doesn't mean, doesn't have uh, much sense, and it's good that uh, the NDCs are involving private sector and decisions that are being taken are always uh, looked into the perspective of being uh, investable and uh, the private sector would benefit uh, from the decisions that are being taken. So going back to the question, uh, investing into uh, these initiatives, indeed, uh, it is very costly. 
and uh, the reason behind it is uh, that uh, these are initiatives that have just come. Uh, most of these uh, uh, green uh, projects that are being uh, put into action are things to do with uh, investment that are being under research and development. And uh, you know how costly to go into the research of uh, any product that is being designed for the market. You need to go into vigorous research and uh, putting a product on the market requires you to be 100% sure if the product is going to perform. And if it doesn't perform, definitely you're going to lose. And uh, private, private sector is there to be sustained by the profit making. So going into the research and development requires time, first of all, requires the resources. And at the end of it all, uh, it is competing with uh, other sectors that have been into existence for a long time. If you're talking about immobility, you are looking at uh, a vehicle that is using electricity, uh, putting electricity into a motion. So it is competing with a petrol vehicle that has been into the existence for ages, for years. Uh, we are not uh, actually looking at the competition in our sector as, as uh, competing each other when it comes to the immobility sector. If one uh, starts a company of uh, you know, innovating into production of an EV, it's actually a good thing. We are looking at it as, a, as an, uh, an addition to the initiatives that are uh, curbing the problems of climate change and uh, we are competing with uh, petrol vehicles that have been into existence for a long time. So these vehicles, petrol vehicles, have been doing a lot of marketing. The perception is already understood. Everyone perceives that uh, a petrol vehicle can take you from one place to another. An EV is uh, maybe the infrastructure is not yet in place. Like here in Rwanda, yes, we say Rwanda is small, but definitely the first vehicle that is being produced, it can go up to probably 1,000 kilometers. So traveling from here to Changugu, coming back and going maybe to Gisenyi, you find it's a challenge if the infrastructure is not available. So at the end of it all, uh, infrastructure is very important. And you know how much it costs to invest into uh, charging infrastructure. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, the ecosystem, uh, if you look at the petrol vehicles, some are investing into uh, innovation of uh, engine, others into innovation of body parts, and other people are innovating into petrol business, whereby others are investing into uh, the infrastructure of uh, petrol business. Uh, the petrol stations are available, but looking at the charging infrastructure is still a challenge. And this calls for the governments, if at all the talks are going to be in action, to invest much into the infrastructure and support the private sector to be sustainable into this business. Uh, again, uh, looking at, uh, I mentioned it as the limited awareness. Everyone here, whoever comes to my office asking about the information of electric vehicle, he asks me, uh, is it sustainable? Do we really have technicians who are able to curb the issues of technical issues? Trainings are much required. If you go to the academias, looking at uh, the research that are being undertaken, do we have good technicians who are able to uh, even invent into the research and development for battery technology? We have uh, what we call high voltage, uh, high voltage batteries. This is, uh, you, you can imagine putting uh, uh, 350 kilowatt into the motion. It's like a bomb. Do we have technicians who are able to curb if something happens? Are the security institutions, firefighters institutions, are they willing to curb with the, 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 the situations that might arise? when uh, issues arise in, in terms of uh, uh, the battery that is in two motion. So all in all, the governments are called to uh, support this by providing incentives to support these uh, new 
initiatives that are coming. And on top of that, if you're looking at a African setup, let's say, give an example of Rwanda, we are an unlocked country. You know how much it costs to bring in a petrol to Rwanda? Mm -hmm. It is costly. Uh, so the government of Rwanda should support e-mobility because we, are, we have a local initiative of producing our own electricity. This electricity is turning into even balancing of the economy. Mm -hmm. I, I, the importation of petrol is costly, but the yeah. production of electricity definitely is low compared to the petrol that we are being importing from other countries. So having said that, it is very eminent that the governments should support immobility sectors, uh, the green initiatives, to even fight for the environment that is deteriorating and, that, and even giving the health issues to all of us and the generations that are coming up. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Donald, for that. Uh, indeed, the government is supporting uh, the private sector in areas that are not immediately investable or where we can have a guarantee of investment on ret um, return on investment. Uh, but as you said, new initiatives, new technologies require a very high capex. They require quite extensive R&D. Um, and as you said, you're completing with uh, traditional solutions and technologies that have been uh, evolving for several years, and therefore um, there's a need to invest in that as well. You know, invest in the, the awareness, invest in the skills development, uh, and uh, a complete understanding of the technology behind uh, these different unique uh, initiatives. Thank you for that. Um, DDG Foste, I'll come back to you um, as a follow-up to uh, Pablo's um, remark. He said that we are at the point when we are going to update our NDCs, but we need to make them investable, we need to make them implementable, uh, and at the same time, we still need to elevate um, uh, the, the ambitions. We, we cannot stay uh, at the current level of ambitions because we still need to elevate um, our initiatives. So where do you see necessities for adjustments uh, with regard to the next generation of NDCs? Uh, as the custodian for the implementation of NDCs in Rwanda, what can we expect from an updated climate action plan? Thank you, thank you, moderator, for, for the good question once again. Uh, this year, uh, 2024, has been dedicated for assessment uh, uh, of the progress we made in terms of implementing the, the NDC. While the next year will mainly focus on development of or the next generation or the update of NDC and be able to submit it by uh, end of next year, end of 2025. So uh, after uh, four years of implementation, we have noticed various uh, key areas to improve and to focus on during the uh, formulation and development of the next generation of NDC. But I will mention uh, there, are, there are many, but let me touch on only five. The first one uh, is that uh, after developing the uh, carbon market uh, implementation framework, national framework, we realized that uh, there are some of the contributions which we aligned under the con unconditional contributions and de facto make them uh, unerigible for carbon market, which we need to make sure that we transfer them under conditional uh, contribution so that they can be eligible for carbon market. Some of them are, are for instance, uh, energy efficiency, uh, forestry. Uh, most of them, according to uh, Article 6, uh, and depending to the positive and negative list we mentioned in our, uh, in our uh, carbon market framework, we need to make adjustment in terms of shifting some of the contribution from unconditional to condition. That's number one. Number two, uh, we are envisaging to make our NDC 
more inclusive. More inclusive, uh, we have been uh, getting uh, some positive critics. I'm, I'm calling them positive critics, but uh, <laughs> critics are uh, mostly negative. But for, for us, we are taking them in the positive way because we have a chance to uh, improve and there is a room of improvement uh, next year. Uh, there is gender inclusion. Uh, basically, the, the, the chapter of cross-cutting areas. Uh, gender inclusion, uh, disability. Uh, uh, last year we had, uh, we had disasters and you can't talk about reducing the vulnerability of your people without taking into consideration some of the disadvantaged people uh, or, or category of your people. We saw how some of the disabled people have been stranded in the landslides where everyone was uh, just trying to, uh, 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 to go in the safe place. So we need to make sure that our NDC, our next generation of NDC is inclusive enough. So apart from gender, we have also disability. We have also elders and children. Uh, so uh, basically, we need to have uh, 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 a full-fledged chapter on cross-cutting areas uh, while we saw that it was not catered for in the current uh, NDC. Number three, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us. Uh, we are concluding NST1. Uh, we are now working on NST2, which is going to have uh, uh, a five years uh, horizon. So while we are developing our national strategy for transformation uh, second generation, it will be at the same time while we will be working on the updated NDC. So it's an opportunity of aligning the targets. And uh, aligning the targets of the two will help us uh, uh, again uh, uh, to cater for uh, contribution of all partners, including uh, civil society, uh, development partners, uh, decentralized entities uh, which are contributing at the same time to our uh, national strategy for transformation second generation as, uh, 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 as well as to our uh, NDC. Uh, number four, uh, we are seeing a, uh, a positive move from different uh, a positive move from different uh, development partners. Uh, one of the uh, clear example is the, this uh, climate talks, uh, elevating the, uh, our German embassy as uh, a climate diplomacy uh, focus uh, embassy. This is also giving us another chance and opportunity for leveraging uh, the contribution of different DPs, different development partners, uh, in terms of uh, uh, implementing, formulating, and implementing the next generation of uh, 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 NDC. Last but not least, we are uh, anticipating uh, to uh, include uh, new technology and various innovations which we saw uh, during this uh, uh, implementation period of our NDC, but uh, also uh, innovations like uh, Navigator, like Pablo said, it's an opportunity for, uh, for us when we will be reflecting on the raising ambition, because we, in the Paris Agreement, it is very clear, we are not going uh, back we have to uh, raise ambition 
from where we are now. So if we pledge 38% reduction of our emission by 2030, then we need to uh, explore all the opportunity possible to make sure that we are moving forward, not backward. So those are the five points we are, uh, you can expect from our NDC. But there are so many. Those are a few, yeah. few ones I just uh, mentioned. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, DDG. Coming to you, uh, Pablo, uh, listening to the DDG, we can see that the government is already uh, strategically positioning itself with, uh, to update the NDCs, looking at being informed by critical uh, frameworks such as the Carbon Market Implementation Framework, uh, increasing inclusivity in the NDCs, um, ensuring that there's new technologies and innovation, and aligning uh, with our NST2. Uh, what do you see as the role of the international uh, community uh, and development partners in working together with Rwanda in implementing its NDCs? Thank you. And uh, well, uh, I think that those five points and the others are, are critical. And I think those are part of the things that you will find in the navigator, you know, opportunities to, to raise ambition. So, so it's great to hear that and happy to support in any way possible. Um, and I think that when you talk about uh, international cooperation, there's always two sides, of course. You know? And uh, you need to start with, with a clear and strong country leadership um, to drive in the cooperation and the collaboration amongst partners uh, to support the priorities of the government. You know, it needs to be a country-driven exercise. Um, and for that, Rwanda has uh, made a lot uh, in, in having a strong foundation for uh, strong climate action. You know, it has demonstrated political leadership at the highest level. The role that Rwanda plays in the international arena is fundamental. It has a clear whole of government approach um, with uh, also a long-term vision for carbon neutrality, as we heard today, uh, and climate resilience uh, uh, up to 2050. It has a strong 2030 targets in its NDC. It has an implementation framework. Um, and all of this is complemented and embedded within also the National Strategy for Transformation, the Green Growth and Climate Resilience Strategy, and in general, a strong enabling environment. But also, it has demonstrated that it has strong institutions and a framework for coordination across the government for that whole of government approach um, and with partners also to bring them together and to get the best out of all of them. And a lot has been done in terms of climate finance and it's, it's really impressive. And, and we saw a little bit of that, but uh, uh, the role of the Rwanda Green Fund in mobilizing uh, climate investment from public and private and international and national um, sources is, is a critical element. And now, I think it's taking a critical step forward, which is taking a programmatic approach to implementation with large-scale, large-impact investment plans that cut across sectors, geographies, and development priorities. And we see this as one of those critical enablers for implementation. And that's what allows investors and partners to come in with significant contributions. And we have been honored over the last few years to accompany Rwanda in, in this journey and to support through our members um, uh, the actions of the government. And I, I want to recognize Germany uh, through the government, through GIZ, through G KFW. They've done a lot, but also here in this room, uh, I see UNDP, uh, GGGI, of course, uh, Sweden, Belgium, Denmark, all partners of Rwanda. And, that is achieved with that leadership of the government. That attracts that cooperation and allows for it. Um, from the development of the current NDC that was supported by NDC partnership members, as well as the implementation plan, through embedded coordination and finance advisors that are helping the government with its own capacity, the NDC partnership has been proud to contribute to the transformation of Rwanda's climate policy environment and strengthening its coordination mechanisms, uh, the development of innovative financial mechanisms, um, and leveraging a strategic NDC investment opportunity. Uh, but of course, that's never enough, and there's always a lot that is needed. So development and implementing partners need to continue to play a critical, important role in supporting the government through two main ways. The first one is scaling up support and making sure that they're aligning they're programming to Rwanda's priorities, and they have been set and they're clear out there. So it should be an easy job. And the second one is actively coordinating and working with each other so that we can 
see the synergies of that collaboration on the ground to maximize the benefits of the limited resources that are available, which is also a reality. Um, and of course, the NDC partnership is a platform to support that coordination and to mobilize support for countries. So we're very happy to support it. And we're very thankful for the leadership of Rwanda as one of our co-chairs uh, alongside, uh, um, uh, alongside Denmark in driving all of this effort. No, we really believe that by working together, we achieve more. That's our motto. And uh, we're seeing uh, the results of that in Rwanda. So we're very, pr very proud to be a, a strong partner. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pablo. Indeed, uh, the government has started to look at a more programmatic approach, uh, which elevates the kind of investment that's required. Uh, uh, but critically, uh, it's important to be able to scale up and align the support across DPs, across uh, different investors, uh, and ensure that this investment is actually coordinated. Otherwise, we will not create the required synergies and we'll end up with a lot of um, um, uh, overlaps and uh, gaps in our investments. Uh, I like that you emphasize that it has to be uh, country-led, it has to be uh, owned by the country and driven by the country in order to be able to attract uh, cooperation and uh, strategic uh, coordination. Thank you for that. Um, coming back to you, uh, Eva. Um, we've had from uh, DDG uh, Forste on uh, how the government is preparing for uh, updating the NDCs. We've listened to Pablo sharing with us what's critical to be able to attract uh, investment from uh, different parties. Um, coming to you, what is, looking at your perspective of things, what areas should receive particular consideration in the next generation of Rwanda's climate action? Thank you so much. I think I won't be going far from what did you say then, Pablo. Um, I think climate finance is a must and must be included if NDC is uh, some vehicle bring us to a destination. Climate finance is the engine, but I'm not, I'm not good with the, <laughs> the cars, but I think it's, it's uh, important to prioritize climate finance. But also given one the um, vulnerability to climate impacts, prioritizing also adaptation strategies, making sure that uh, we improve the, uh, the agriculture sector, which plays a big role in our country, is improved. We have like food securities, but there's also limitation to adaptation. And that's when we say loss and damage. So it's important that the next generation NDC include loss and damage, and that also, as DDG mentioned, protects the most vulnerable, the disabled people, the children uh, who are facing already the climate impacts. And also it's important also to promote um, collaboration between different sectors, um, civil society, youth organization, the government, making sure that uh, we maximize um, mobilizing climate finance and also we work hand in hand in implementing uh, the NDC. Thank you so much. Thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Eva Peace. I think I actually uh, like the emphasis on the loss and damage because that helps to rebuild where you have not been able to mitigate or adapt, that you're able to um, uh, rebuild uh, accordingly and that there's a focus on inclusivity as the DDG mentioned, looking at vulnerable groups um, in the communities and most importantly, uh, prioritizing adaptation uh, with a focus on sectors that are most vulnerable and contribute to the economic growth, things like agriculture, uh, where we have to focus on uh, uh, food security. So thank you very much for those um, um, insights as well. Um, Donald, uh, coming back to you. Um, as the executive chairman of Prev Rwanda, what green financing opportunities is Prev Rwanda currently benefiting from? Uh, and what advice do you have for other private sector companies looking to contribute to Rwanda's uh, climate action? Thank you for that question. Actually, I will not talk uh, only the, on focusing on uh, PREV Rwanda. As the chairman of e-mobility in Rwanda, uh, we commend, I mean, we thank the government of Rwanda for having introduced uh, tools, financial tools that are in supporting the the, fi uh, the green initiatives uh, by creating a Rwanda Green Fund. Actually, it was said to support uh, the green initiative to be put into the motion. 
So looking at, uh, at the tools that are already available, they have been supporting uh, our initiatives, our green businesses, uh, through uh, grants, through uh, uh, the grants for innovations, and uh, e-mobility sector have uh, actually benefited, not only Prev Rwanda, but also other companies that are into this space. And uh, looking at those initiatives, uh, we have uh, Rwanda Green Fund that has supported to gear the green innovation projects. And uh, these are meant for the, the, the financial tools that are meant for this. We have uh, several grants, which are purely, uh, I may say, free, not free money, but uh, of course with conditions. Uh, with approvals of uh, you know the initiatives that is meant to have an impact to the society, so the grants have been uh, benefiting us in this sector, and also they have uh, introduced what we call recoverable grants, and these grants are meant to be there for some time. You get the money you put into use in terms of business and getting profit, so and this money would be recovered in future, and this money would actually be acting as a recover, I mean, as a revolving fund that would, would even support some other new initiatives that would come uh, uh, along the, the business. And then uh, looking at the Green Fund, they have also a tool called Equity, where they are actually, uh, however much they ha it hasn't been put into practice, but uh, we are hoping it is, it is going to happen. The Equity where Green Fund uh, should come and invest into your business and at the end of the day, they get some shares, and this share would be, uh, you know, sold back to the green fund, to the business itself, after realizing that it is it is profitable. So it is a, a very, very interesting tool that is supporting private sector in green businesses, and this is uh, something that we actually thank the the, th the authorities to for have thought about this to support this initiative. Then there is also pure debt or loan at a, a, a subsidized rate, you know how much it is costly to, you know, go into commercial banks and get money for investing. It's a bit costly and uh, uh, it has, they have thought about it and they have, uh, you know, reduced the interest rate to, uh, act to a minimum rate that would be supporting the, the businesses that are in issue. Uh, so the advice I would give uh, to the private people who are into this, First of all is to have good projects, have business plans that are, are business oriented. You just uh, think of a business, a sustainable business that will not just but die a natural death in the next five or four years, just to do a good business plan and submit it to the Green Fund. And uh, that is what we have done in Prev Rwanda. We have uh, already benefited from Ireme, Ireme Fund uh, which is a tool that has gone through Development Bank of Rwanda and uh, because of the project proposed that we submitted with the supporting documents that are vividly for the business, it has uh, given us a chance to access the finance. So having a good plan uh, that is broken into short to long term uh, businesses which is uh, showing the sustainability of the business mm -hmm. is uh, an advice that I would argue for the private people to use if they need to access into the green finance. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Donald. Uh, yes, indeed, there are already existing financial tools that have been put in place, uh, also accompanied by other government incentives. And uh, quite correctly, uh, it's up to the private sector to prepare sustainable business plans. Uh, that introduce innovation, but also show um, a forward thinking in, in, in their interventions and initiatives to be able to tap into these uh, financial, to financial tools and uh, incentives provided by uh, the government. Thank you very much uh, to our panelists. Uh, if you will allow, I will open up for a short Q&A. Uh, we'll get a few questions from our audience. Uh, I'd like to kindly request that when you do um, take on the mic, please introduce yourself quickly and keep the question uh, short and succinct so that we are able to um, optimize the remaining time. Uh, if the protocol team can support in uh, moving the um, 
microphone around. Being a lady, I always believe in uh, starting with the ladies. So I will uh, look in the audience for a young lady to start. No ladies starting. Um, we have a lady. Yeah, unfortunately, it's a gentleman. Ladies, if you raise your hand, uh, uh, Donald might give you a discount on the electric vehicle. But if you don't, then he won't, he won't know you're here. Yeah? OK, all right. Uh, let's move to uh, the gentleman in the back. Please introduce yourself very quickly, and then uh, uh, straight to your question. And if you have a specific uh, panelist you'd like to address the question to, please do uh, uh, indicate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. I coordinated the Rwanda Climate Exchange and Development Network. I came to Kigali Keramit Talks with expectations that what gets out of here will influence continental talks and global talks. And good enough, the global director of NDC partnership is in the house. One of my major concerns is that when we talk about climate change, it's all about global warming. And global warming is as a result of emissions. Rwanda has done so much, and I appreciate what the Rwandan government is doing. But even if it reduced its emissions to zero by 100% no emissions, it would still be so insignificant that, that climate change would still come and hit Rwandans. And so my question is, what are we doing at the global NDC partnership to ensure that the countries which are meeting are actually increasing their ambitions other than looking at the global south where even if the emissions were not talked about, still nothing would change. Uh, I would also wish to know the emerging global emitters like India, are they becoming part of the partnership? Have they resisted? Is there any change that is being made because they still continue to emit higher? It's good that Germany is in the house and being one of the greater meters on, uh, on the European continent, I hope uh, that you are doing something to reduce on your emissions equally and also influencing Europe to do the same because ultimately it's about reducing emissions, it's about reducing global, uh, global warming. And to my friend Faustin, uh, the focal point of uh, NDCs, I mean not NDCs, but uh, UNFCCC, uh, what are we doing on the continent? Uh, as Rwanda, what are we doing on the continent to, to influence continental talks and also translate the African concerns into the global discussions? Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that, uh, for those questions, Voningoma. I think the panelists have captured them and will respond uh, appropriately. Um, can we have uh, another question? We have Thank somebody. Uh, can the protocol team kindly, uh, yes, okay, great, thank you. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, uh, I can see because of the light. Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, my name is Jacques Nyonzima, and I'm a student from the University of Rwanda in the Faculty of Forestry and the Nature Conservation. Um, me is not a problem, but an opinion. I want to talk about the point Nyaziki uh, uh, talked about more inclusiveness. Um, my opinion is that uh, also to involve children. I see that as a good point to involve children there because children, to be honest, the children, they are very good, kind, and they are very good. So, like, as I told you, uh, I'm from forestry. Uh, you, can, you can go there in rural areas and teach teachers how every children should plant even one tree one tree for each child. I think this can be more successful for years after. Thank you, so Thank much. you very much uh, for that recommendation, Nyonzima. Very true. Yes, Children uh, absorb uh, and uh, uh, are willing to implement much faster and much easier than the youth. 
I mean, much easier than uh, older uh, generations. But also, in addition to that, they are our tomorrow's future, and therefore, to start to build them uh, to that uh, commitment is, is quite critical. But I'll uh, allow the DDG to speak to that when he's answering the questions. Um, yes, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for informative session. Uh, my name is Takashi. Uh, I'm from Migration Manage uh, uh, International Organization for Migration. Uh, I have a question to DDG Nema. Uh, I, we, we discussed about the importance of uh, adaptation, and uh, I believe that as a uh, Rwanda, you're committed to develop a national adaptation plan. I, I just wanted to hear if you have any plan on developing uh, that uh, national adaptation plan to be submitted to UNFCCC. Thank you. That question, uh, Takashi. Uh, the GGG will uh, respond alongside uh, with others. Thank you. Thank you for the discussion. My name is Virgilio Quizera. I am from JK Rwanda office, WASH program coordinator. So as uh, I heard from Pablo saying, I say that uh, NDC should be friendly and implementable. Uh, I want to ask to DDG Rema if there is any plan for capacity building for planners in the various sectors and also uh, awareness raising for uh, the ongoing, uh, this ongoing framework to, to protect the environment. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll ask the panelists to respond to those first set of questions and then we'll come back for one more round of questions uh, before we close uh, this session. Um, maybe we can start with Pablo. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you for that question because it's it's extremely important what you what you asked uh, in terms of uh, how we all need to uh, uh, contribute and how there's a set of countries that have uh, a much bigger impact than Rwanda in terms of of uh, the exercise of reducing the emissions. So. That's also a very relevant conversation for us in the steering committee of the NDC partnership over the last two days. But I want to start by saying that, uh, of course, uh, when we look at emissions and mitigation, uh, the contributions of most of the developing countries is insignificant. Uh, but climate change is not just about mitigation. And um, the consequences are being seen today. So the importance of increasing also the ambition around mitigation, uh, adaptation is fundamental because at the end of the day, we're talking about development. We're talking about sustainable development and countries that don't align their development pathway with climate mitigation and adaptation, then they will stay behind. So, so that's a critical element. But you're absolutely right. Uh, a set of countries have the biggest emissions and if they don't step up, then we will not see the transformation that we need. And as part of the NDC partnership, we have a, a strong group of developed countries that are fully committed. And we already know that uh, the European Union is, is looking at a proposal of reducing emissions um, uh, to, up to 90% by 2040, which is, which is a huge commitment. It's under negotiation. They should be ready early next year. Um, but that sends a very strong message. Um, and other countries are looking at how they align with the 1.5 degrees and with what's um, their fair share of reduction of emissions. China, India are not part of the NDC partnership, uh, so I cannot speak uh, about their efforts specifically, uh, but uh, there is strong collaboration from our members with those governments to try to advance this as much as possible. But it all starts with um, those who are developed countries being an example for the others putting forward very um, ambitious NDCs. And the hope is that over the next year and a half, while all the countries come to the table, that we start by seeing those big commitments coming from the developed countries um, on the next few months, ideally. And uh, as we look at our work of the partnership, we're looking at the collective. No, we were discussing this yesterday, and the members of the NDC partnership cover 43% of global emissions. Uh, so the discussion is not just 
developed versus developing. It's how we collectively will deliver uh, by, by Belém next year. So hopefully we'll, in the next round of the Kigali Climate Talks, we'll have uh, good examples of how this is turning into, into concrete action on the ground. But thank you for that, uh, for that question. And we need to keep them accountable. And having this conversation is fundamental in that sense. Thank you very much, uh, Pablo. Um, over you to you, uh, DDG. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me start with uh, the question of Vuningoma Foste. Thank you for the for the concerns. Uh, as Pablo said, uh, if we don't change the course, uh, we are not where we are heading is not uh, pro promising. Uh, but uh, specifically, you asked me what are we doing at continent level uh, and at country level. Uh, of course, uh, each country is sovereign, uh, but uh, one of the uh, importance of uh, being a party to convention, it's, uh, it's that we have common uh, goal and we have obligations. So uh, what we are doing at continent level, of course we are trying to uh, influence uh, our position on various uh, contentious issues like that one of raising ambition uh, through our African group of negotiators as a bloc, uh, not as a country alone. Uh, but uh, we are trying to also to show how the continent, uh, I, I mean Africa is contributing around 4% of global emissions and we are yet the most vulnerable continent. So this speaks a lot and we uh, have to uh, speak that we have to uh, uh, come back on that uh, so that we can at least uh, show them uh, that we have that moral authority of asking. We are not asking much, but we want uh, a, share fair, uh, a fair share, as uh, uh, Pablo said. Uh, as a ca at a country level, uh, what we can only do is to lead by example. Uh, the contribution of Rwanda uh, in terms of emission is uh, 0.001%. And uh, in actual sense, we, we couldn't even sit here and talk about reducing emissions because th they are very few. But since we are signatory to the convention and we need to lead by example, and we need to have that moral authority, by the way, that's why a country like Rwanda can uh, have an ambitious target of reducing 38% of our emissions, even though our contribution is very minimal. So leading by example, that's wh why Rwanda can take a good example, as uh, my friend Donald said, exonerating all the e-vehicles and uh, 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 other areas where we can uh, gain some uh, environmental benefits. Uh, it's not because uh, uh, we, uh, we are exceptional, but it's because uh, we want to lead by example uh, so that we can uh, influence even others by saying, if Rwanda can, can do so, even others can do. Uh, that's, that's, that's what uh, we, we are doing, that's what we can do or to keep uh, raising that moral authority in our camp. Uh, then Yon um from University of Rwanda, involving youth uh, not only in the planting trees, but also in all initiatives uh, of environmental protection and climate change is paramount. There is no question about it, youth is a good agent of change. If we don't partner, if we don't work with the youth, uh, we will not see the change we want to see in the society. We won't see 
the change of mindset uh, of people by embracing some good practices in terms of uh, building resilience of this country. So we have a lot of initiatives uh, involving youth. Uh, uh, by, by the way, last week, uh, no, last, uh, last two weeks, we had uh, a workshop of all environmental clubs in different uh, high learning institutions. Uh, we gathered them uh, for a whole week in Musanze and we were very impressed with the brilliant ideas they have. Uh, sometimes we are just sitting in the offices pretending that we, we know what is happening, but when you realize that uh, uh, the youth has power, they are the agent of change really when you gather them and sit with them. So we got uh, so many powerful message and engagement from their side. But uh, in terms of planting trees, uh, uh, the Minister of Environment together with Rwanda Forest Authority, every year we have a robust campaign of planting trees and I'm sure each institution uh, is allocated where to plant and including schools. So we will keep this uh, uh, and still there is a room of improvement. Uh, then uh, Nakashi importance of adaptation. Yeah, we know we know the importance of adaptation. That's why I said we need to make sure that we reduce vulnerability of our people. Uh, referring, for instance, uh, last year we we lost uh, more than 130 people, or just in in one night. So. Oh, we can't, we can't preach the converted people. We, we know the, 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 the relevance of building resilience. We know the relevance of uh, reducing the vulnerability of our people versus climate change impacts. Uh, but uh, formulating and submitting the, the NAP, uh, initially uh, we, we had the green growth and climate resilience strategy which has the part of adaptation and the part of mitigation. So uh, we, we, we were convinced that uh, there is no need of submitting or developing another adaptation plan where we have the green growth and climate resilience strategy. Until uh, this year, uh, when we, uh, uh, we did uh, uh, analysis and so that there are two elements which are missing uh, in our uh, strategy so that it can cater for all the uh, parameters of uh, NAP, uh, including the development of the uh, investment plan, uh, which, is a which, which is a mandatory component on the NAP. So now we embarked on the process of developing it through the support of GCF, and we are anticipating to work on it uh, uh, this year, and hopefully uh, to submit it uh, by COP29 or after COP. So that's where we are. Uh, it's it's a, uh, it's just a, a question of uh, uh, analysis and appreciation. Initially, we thought that we we don't need it because we had a full-fledged adaptation strategy through our green growth strategy, and now uh, we are trying to work on it to cover some of the missing parts. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, DDG. Maybe uh, one last question, I believe. Yeah, there was another on, uh, question of Quizera. Yeah. Uh, on capacity building, uh, capacity building is, is, is is, is a cornerstone and actually is one of the enabling pillar of our NDC and also our green growth and climate resilience strategy. We are having uh, capacity building initiatives uh, uh, targeting various uh, uh, um, targeting various category of people. Uh, we have initiated through the Ministry of Environment and REMA and other key partners. We have initiated 
a memorandum of understanding with various uh, universities, international and national. We have uh, a memorandum of understanding with uh, AIMS. Uh, we have concluded uh, a training of greenhouse gases emission uh, assessment of nine months of various uh, 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 technicians and experts working in different sectors of uh, in different ministries and it was uh, 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 a foundation to, uh, to, to to the transparency we want to see from various uh, sectors uh, we through various projects we have worked with the uh, universe of Rwanda we funded more than uh, 50 uh, 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 50 uh, uh, masters uh, masters research in terms of uh, climate change adaptation and uh, uh, through through uh, uh, through the HEC uh, High Education Council uh, basically we are we are we are providing uh, the scholarship uh, for for young students. Uh, who want to do their research in climate change adaptation. Uh, we have, uh, again, uh, various uh, uh, short-term informal uh, training targeting uh, 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 various uh, uh, partners. Uh, civil society we have been uh, uh, working together, convening them. Mm -hmm. uh, we have also or capacity building, targeting, especially uh, understanding the, uh, the the basics of environment and the climate change, so that they can be able to mainstream environment and the climate change at different layers and, and at different levels. So, uh, uh, but uh, education, capacity building is a continuous uh, activity. And uh, uh, doors are open uh, from our end uh, to, 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 to partner with uh, various key partners who are helping us in that uh, 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 activity. Mm -hmm. We have seen various partners also chipping in, uh, training people, mm -hmm. uh, inviting us to deliver some of the uh, um, presentations mm -hmm. through various trainings. So we want to encourage various partners uh, to, 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 to join our hands and uh, uh, okay. move forward, especially in terms of uh, keeping developing the capacity of different categories. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Pablo and uh, Foster. Uh, we'll take uh, two more questions, and then uh, uh, we come to a close. Uh, have somebody there. Good afternoon. Um, <coughs> sorry. I'm coming from WHO, uh, World Health Organization. I'm Admiral uh, Nkube. I wanted to reflect on mainstreaming, which we keep referring to, especially as we look to the next generation of NDCs, whether part of the stock take would go deeper to explore the extent to which sectors have been mainstreamed. Um, because not all sectors are the same, not all sectors are, are somehow affected the same or can contribute the same, but whereby we have an objective way of really being clear of which sectors need more work or which sectors um, are still lagging behind. And I'm um, looking at climate and health, that is becoming increasingly topical and which is important for us to also be clear in terms of mainstreaming. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, one more question. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Sylvain Dajijiman, uh, now representing uh, Rwandese Association of Ecologists. Uh, my question is addressing to uh, Mr. DDG, uh, of course, uh, climate action. Uh, we need more thinking on innovations, but I think we have also to strengthen what is the best practice we have. 
uh, for me or my perspective, uh, when I, I can see what we have, that is, in terms of energy, uh, we have what uh, RPGs or liquefied petroleum gas, uh, which is a best practice to uh, to manage or to reduce the emissions. But when you look at, at the field, you know, most of the time, you can see that the the issue of capacity uh, of ad access or affording those RPGs or gases is still uh, a concern or a problem. Oh, my question is, is what is the government ambition so that uh, the smallholder incomes can access to those RPGs that can be uh, make a bigger uh, impact on us? Thanks. Thank you very much. I think all the questions were addressed to the DDG, so we'll <laughs> allow you to uh, respond to them uh, before we uh, proceed to closing the session. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, our friend from uh, uh, World Health Organization. Uh, mainstreaming uh, environment and the climate change in the health sector is, uh, is very key. Uh, for the matter of fact, uh, uh, in the COP28, we had... Uh, uh, a separate uh, discussion on uh, 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 health, uh, climate and health. And we had even uh, uh, a separate, uh, it's not a petition, it's, it's, a, it's a commitment we signed um, uh, among, uh, around other countries uh, where we want to make sure that uh, uh, when we are talking about impact, climate change impact uh, versus the health sector, we understand first of all what are the impact and we understand what could be uh, the, the uh, mitigation uh, of those uh, uh, impact. So uh, in that uh, perspective, uh, health has been uh, one of the sector we are considering in our mainstreaming uh, journey. Uh, we worked uh, together with the uh, Minister of Health at Rwanda Biomedical Center and other key partners in health uh, sector to make sure that uh, we, we understand first of all the vulnerability uh, of the sector itself versus climate change impact and also implement together various uh, 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 actions. Uh, indeed, we are working together with the Rwanda Biomedical Center to develop a big project with World Bank uh, uh, to, to, to make sure that we are, uh, we are responding to some of those uh, impacts we observed in various uh, assessments we conducted. So uh, I want to reassure you that uh, uh, we are not yet where we want to be in terms of mainstreaming environment and climate change uh, in the health sector, but at least uh, uh, the trajectory is promising. Uh, Sylvain, uh, what is the government ambition? We have a serious challenge on um, uh, having alternative uh, sources of energy, which is uh, uh, clean energy uh, in the country for cooking. Uh, but uh, this goes hand in hand with, uh, with the development path of a country. We cannot wake up in the morning and flog to use electricity all of us, use uh, LPG all of us, uh, taking into consideration uh, the uh, the level of development and economic uh, 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 status we have in different corners of the country. But at least what the country uh, pledged is that uh, we are going to, 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 to phase out the dependence on biomass, uh, in especially in cooking, uh, gradually uh, uh, with the ambitious target 
but we are starting with at least for those people with the raw income, at least to use the energy saving cook stoves, energy saving cook stoves, so that we can reduce at least the biomass they are using, they have been using. Uh, for that purpose, uh, we used to have a challenge of uh, certifying even that those cook stoves are uh, efficient uh, or are responding to the challenges we have, but uh, uh, good enough or through or various support through the Ministry of Environment and Rwanda Standard Board, we have now established the uh, thermo efficiency laboratory which is testing thermo efficiency of cook stoves and certify them. So at least now we can be sure that all cook stoves which are being distributed in different community are the real cook stoves uh, which are reducing uh, uh, the, 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 the energy we are using. Then for those uh, with uh, uh, income uh, in different towns uh, and for those institutions which are using so many uh, firewoods like schools, like prisons, uh, uh, they have uh, to embrace uh, the LPG. Uh, we know that uh, LPG as well is not a clean energy, but uh, it's a journey we need to have where to start uh, while we are uh, heading to the clean uh, energy. So uh, for, to incentivize various uh, uh, big institutions using uh, so many firewoods uh, through different projects, uh, especially in Lema, we funded uh, uh, more than 20 schools in uh, Southern province uh, to, to use LPG. Now they, they can testify. Uh, we, we visited them. They are also uh, mobilizing other schools and we worked with the Minister of Education to make sure that at least in new schools, while we are now uh, uh, enforcing uh, the guidance of uh, school feeding at school, we need to make sure that uh, schools um, are shifting from uh, biomass to, 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 to LPG, at least the big institutions, because those, those are the big consumers. And then uh, 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 for citizens, uh, we, mo we shift gradually uh, uh, without uh, um, uh, harming the, the, their, their, their uh, conditions of living. That's what I can say as of now, uh, but uh, uh, we need, it's, it's an area which needs, actually it's one of the area which is lagging behind when you see the, mm -hmm. the, the achievement of our NST2. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that, uh, DDG. Uh, kindly join me in uh, uh, extending a hand of applause to our panelists. Um, they've been quite uh, informative uh, in a very short time, have been able to share some very critical insights. Uh, I'll just, uh, I would have liked to have a, a takeaway uh, from each panelist. However, in the interest of time, we started a bit late, so I will just quickly summarize a few uh, things that I noted from their different interventions. Uh, Pablo indicated that we definitely have to raise our ambitions in the next NDCs, uh, but most importantly, these have to be um, technically sound, just, and inclusive. Uh, and at the same time, they need to be implementable and investable across all sectors. Um, he emphasized the need for ownership and leadership in order to guarantee coordination of investment, but from the DPs as well to look at scaling up and alignment of the support that is being uh, offered. Um, for the DDG, he highlighted that the government of Rwanda is ready. We are currently doing a qualitative uh, uh, assessment of the implementation of the NDCs with the quantitative reporting expected at the end of this year and the updating of the NDCs to start uh, in 2025. Already, this is being informed by some of the uh, ongoing initiatives, such as the Carbon Market Implementation Framework, 
uh, an increase in the inclusivity in the NDCs, uh, especially um, across cross-cutting interventions such as gender equality and social inclusion. Alignment with the NST2 is uh, a very uh, important uh, benefit as both of these um, uh, strategies will be uh, being uh, um, updated at the same time. Most importantly, we'll be looking to leverage the commitment of DPs uh, alongside introducing new technologies and uh, innovation. Um, Eva quite um, uh, eloquently highlighted to us that youth are at the center of private sector, civil society, and uh, are representatives of the community's voices. Therefore, their meaningful engagement is very critical in uh, advancing advocacy as well as implementation of our climate uh, action. Uh, one of the emphasis she highlighted, or uh, one of the areas she highlighted, was a need to prioritize adaptation as well as uh, loss and damage. Um, with Donald, uh, he highlighted that uh, we have several financial tools in place, we have several incentives that have been put in place by government. More is still needed because we are uh, dealing with a challenging uh, situation where the innovations that are being introduced require uh, very high capex and a lot of R&D to advance significantly. Um, but he has indicated that with preparatory of sustainable uh, business plans, looking at short and long-term goals, uh, we can actually have the private sector drive uh, our climate action implementation. Thank you all once again. Um, it's been a pleasure to moderate this session, and uh, I'm sure the audience, just as I, have gathered quite a lot of insights from um, all of you. Thank you.